What we reject, too, is when you take the manifestations of God and redemptive purpose through his son, Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary in a time frame, and push that back into the essence of God and say that somehow God is three entities within one framework, which you call God, which obviously in that sense would be a generic term and not identifying any one individual at all. Our position is that God is one and that he is a personality. There is no division within him. If you have persons with him, then you tend toward a tritheistic view of God. That is that you are dividing God into three beings with one common um, a kind of a substance. And, uh, and so we reject that position. We believe that God has revealed himself as Father because he is the Father of Jesus Christ and he is the Father of us in creation. We again believe that the Son was born, that he lived on this earth, that he died, that he was resurrected and exalted up and uh, given power and honor and glory. And we also believe that in the Son was God, God Almighty, not a second person of God who has some kind of existence before as a separate entity of the Father, but he was the Father who came to us as God in flesh. Bernard. It's interesting to note that our doctrine we establish from Scripture. The only way that our doctrine is opposed is by using the term three centers of consciousness or three persons, which we do not find that language or that concept in Scripture. In fact, it comes to mind uh, Van Harvey, in a handbook of theological terms published by Macmillan Press, says that no uh, major Christian theologian has affirmed that God is three centers of consciousness, recognizing that would be really a belief in three gods. And so we must first of all realize that when the Bible says that God is one, it means simply that God is one. No other qualification, no addition to say, yes, but really he has three separate wills or three separate centers of consciousness. And that uh, is the historic God, which uh, is proposed here to mean simply a union as of a man and woman being one, uh, that cannot be substantiated as that was the meaning in reference to God. Because there are many places throughout the Old Testament where Echad is used distinctly for one individual being, such as the list of the kings that are mentioned in Joshua. And so that cannot be a conclusive argument. When you actually look at uh, the use of Echad in relation to God, it's to distinguish him from all other gods, as he is the one and only true God. And so the context will let us know the meaning of that word. And if you're going to speak of pluralities in the Godhead, you'll have to give us specific scriptural references, and let's discuss them. Uh, you, we can't just go in general terms. Now, so we are establishing that God is one. The next thing we want to establish is that Jesus is the one God incarnate. Now, we do not believe that the omnipresent spirit of God was confined or that God somehow lost his omnipresence in the incarnation. We recognize that God was before Jesus Christ was born. God is omnipresent, omnipotent during the time of Christ's earthly ministry. And so we are not trying to reduce God to a human being, but we're saying that in Jesus Christ, God united himself with flesh. And when the Bible says God, it does not mean just one of three persons of God. It means simply God. If we were to accept a Trinitarian model, we would have to say, when the Bible says that Jesus was God with us, Matthew 1.23, that that is the fullness of God. How are you define him? If you define him as three persons, then the scripture would say that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. Uh, John 20.28, 20, when uh, Thomas confessed that Jesus is my Lord and my God. Isaiah 9.6, the child and the son that was born was not merely a human child and son, but he was also called the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And John 14, 9 through 11, Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You have not merely seen the flesh, but you have actually seen God himself in manifestation. Titus 2, 13 speaks of Jesus as our God and Savior. In the context of the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is simply God. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead incarnate. All right. As a Trinitarian, I see one individual speaking to another individual. Uh, the Father responding back to the Son. The Son responding to the Father. And uh, this is what you would expect, okay, from the scriptural standpoint. This, the scripture supports that uh, Jesus steps from one point. McGee goes on and said that this is the key. There's a, another author, uh, Kenneth uh, Reeves, in his book, uh, makes this stem. He says, quote, 
Uh, to the undiscerning, it seems logical to say that the Son and the Father must be two different persons. For whoever heard of his uh, Father, whoever heard of the Son and his Father being one, and this is true. But God is not a person in the same category that uh, people are persons. Unquote. So here we have another example. Okay, where, where, where Reeves is saying that it's a logical conclusion unless you have discernment. So a person picking up the scripture, reading through it, and he sees the son talking to the father. He sees the father talking to the son. The conclusion he comes to is that there is two individuals. You have to have a key, okay, as McGee says. You have to have uh, another kind of uh, input to get the idea that you've got two Individ- or two natures speaking out of the same body because the scriptures certainly uh, doesn't support it. You have, uh, for example, uh, Jesus in uh, John chapter 8, verse uh, 16, John chapter 8, verse 29, and John chapter 16, verse 32, where he says, I am not alone. There's somebody with me. Uh, if, if I was to show up here and I would say, uh, Dave, I'm coming into the studio, but I'm not alone, you would expect somebody else. Now, if I got in here and I said, well, you know, I'm a teacher and I'm a pastor and I'm an evangelist, you know, and we're all coming together, we don't talk like this, you know. As an individual, I don't refer to those entities in myself as another person, as another entity. But this is exactly what we see in the Trinity, okay, in the Godhead, as persons talking to each other as if they are, are individuals, and the Bible supports this. Uh, and, and again, I'm pressing you. Where is the scriptural justification? Where is the idea, okay, or the, where do we get this idea, okay, that... These two, in, that, that the Father and the Son, one entity, okay, stepping, or, or, or stepping from uh, humanity to divinity and talking to each other. This concept of dual nature, I think it's interesting. If I understand correctly, you two gentlemen are, are actually denying, and correct me if I'm wrong, two elements of so-called historic Christianity for the creeds. First of all, eternal generation is part of the Nicene Creed, which says the Son is not mutable or changeable, and it's in subsequent creeds. So... Uh, it looks like that you're approaching our position on that point. Also, the dual, na- dual nature, um, the councils have also said that dual nature, of course, in a Trinitarian sense, they say this eternal son uh, who is God and the humanity. So they see two natures in Christ. So if you're saying that's wrong, then you are denying historic Christianity according to the creeds. But I say that the dual nature, if you want to speak about that, is Jesus said, for example, I thirst. That is a human expression. God is not thirsty. At the same time, he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. Only God can forgive sins. So we're saying that Jesus can speak as God in virtue of his deity. At the same time, we can say that Jesus can speak in virtue of his human experience. That's all we're saying. And to say that when he says, my father is greater than I and so on as that, is to say that that's a second person of the Godhead talking, is to say that your second person is subordinate to the first and not truly God. And when we're talking about Jesus speaking as a real man, and we're talking about Jesus as God, I think even in the Trinitarian sense, they would say that. The question is, is all of the Godhead revealed in Jesus, is he God manifested in the flesh, as 1 Timothy 3.16, Titus 2.13, 2 Corinthians 5.19, and so on, or is he just one of the three persons of the Godhead manifest in the flesh? We say he is God manifest in the flesh. But we both have to agree that he spoke from his human existence, not only from his divine existence. For example, when he said, I am not alone, but the Father is with me. To the Jews that he was looking at at that time, they saw him as a man only. That's all they believed he was. So he had to explain to them, I look like a man, I am a man, you see me as a man, but I am not a man only. The Father is with me. The Father is in me. The Father dwells in me. And it's he who is speaking. It's he that's doing the works. In other words, It's not the humanity alone, but the Father, the Spirit of the Father, not somewhere else, but dwelling in me. And so he could say in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? The example of the right hand of God. Some people picture a Father over here and Jesus sitting over here, two people in heaven. But that's clearly erroneous because God is an omnipresent spirit. God is a spirit. You can't see God. John 4, 24. If Jesus was sitting next to God, is he sitting next to the Trinity? If God is indeed the Trinity. I would say that we cannot see God uh, only as he reveals himself or manifests himself in some way. And that's exactly who Jesus was, the manifestation of God. And so if we were to go to heaven and say, just hypothetically, say, Jesus, I'm glad to see you, but where is the Father? He would say the same thing that he told Philip in John 14. How can you ask to see the Father? To see me is to see the Father. 
in the only way that humans can actually see the Father. If you can't believe the words, look at the works that I'll do. And you see that no mere man is doing these things, but it's the Father who dwells within me that is doing the work. I think this question will really focus the differences between the two of us, although you have confirmed most of what we've said, and we're very close on many points, it seems. Here's the key. When we get to heaven, will we see three divine persons on three thrones or one divine person on one throne? If we will see three on three thrones, that is tritheism, the belief in three gods, no matter how you may try to deny that. But the Bible says in Revelation 4, 2, there's one throne and one on the throne. Revelation 4, 8 with Revelation 1, 8, 7, and 8 identifies that one as Jesus Christ. In him we see Father. He is the Son of God who was born. It's his spirit we receive when we receive the Holy Spirit. So if you will see one in heaven, who is that one? It's the visible image of the invisible God, according to Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, and so on. You will see Jesus Christ. And if you will agree with us that you will see one divine being in heaven, that you will see Jesus Christ, then that is our position.